I think this session is going to be uh, very important, in my opinion. Uh, this is the main reason that the co-chair of the session is the president of the society and myself, you know, we, got, we will try to uh, define uh, the standard for evaluating uh, the result of bariatric surgery responder, uh, non-responder and recidivism. This is very important uh, uh, topics. We are here for very high level, uh, uh, you know, uh, experts uh, uh, dealing with this uh, topic. Uh, we will have, you know, Dr. First, Dr. Armino Ramos, uh, Dr. Javier Salvador, I will introduce all of them afterwards, Dr. Leopoldo Perez de Isla, Marco Buter, and Mary O'Kane, uh, and, and finally, Nahum Belgrater uh, will present all this topic. I think uh, you don't have to move from your uh, sites your place because it's going to be very, very important in terms of getting uh, a final agreement regarding the different approach. Uh, so let's start with our uh, president. I think, you know, uh, until when are you going to be president, Almino? Are you going to be president until when? And, uh, when is Lilian Cao, uh, you know, uh, look over you? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, 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 no, 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 it's over there. I, I know. I think, I think, you, do you think going to be to come here, right? to the podium, right? The, the speakers. OK, so come up. You know the different, the, the other speaker. Can ask Javier Salvador, please. He's a professor of endocrinology at the University of Navarra in Spain. Please come here to the podium. Uh, please, Leopoldo Perez de Isla is a, a, a huge uh, cardiologist. He's very expert. He's professor at the Complutense University in Madrid. Uh, and uh, he's working at the Hospital Clinico San Carlos. I cannot see Marco. Where is Marco? Is Marco Wouter here? I cannot see him. Anyway, so, and Mary, Mary O'Kane, can you come up to the podium, please, here, and have a seat? And Nahum, where is Nahum? I cannot see him yet. Okay, I think we have uh, two speakers uh, pending of the appearance, and and come here, the, the, yeah, the commenter, Dr. Sanjay Agrabal and Carlos Casalnuvo. Are you there? Carlos, please. Come here. I think, uh, Hi, come in here. Let me ask for some, a couple of more. Nahun, you have to, to stay there as speaker. Okay. Uh, in so, let's start. Uh, Albino, yeah, yeah. what do you want? Uh, Sahai. We are looking for two more shares. So, um, the idea of this session is to analyze the standards we have in bariatric surgery, bariatric and metabolic. Uh, because when we offer uh, surgery for patients like this. Can we have the screen? Okay, thank you. When we offer surgery for patients like this, uh, the idea or issue is that we have some way to try to identify which procedure should be better for each one of these patients. But really, what we have right now as guidelines for that are very poor. And it's very difficult when we put in, in a grade of evaluation like this to see what is a success and what is not a success in bariatric metabolic surgery. But look, this is an old article. This is 1992, an article about uh, critical analysis of results in weight loss and quality of the data by Bob Brolin in the United States. And in 1992, Brolin concluded that we have a lot of lack of standards for reporting results. One of the problems is that 
we have different techniques, so we cannot compare the result of one technique with another one. Very poor follow-up of the patients and not enough quality of the data reported. These are the, 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 the basis for evaluation of the result of bariatric and metabolic surgery. And you see the proposal by Halverson in 81 and Keller when they just based it in a small group of patients they concluded that a good result should be to have more than 50% of excess weight loss. In the next year, McLean and Porris changed it and they proposed a total weight loss of 25% in order to consider a good result of the surgery. Reynolds proposed something a little different and we have Lechner, Martin, Balthasar, uh, Barros classifications with different proposals in order to evaluate result of bariatric surgery. If we look this systematic review of bariatric surgery, and this is 2015, we'll see a lot of different proposals. So we have 50% excess weight loss, 25, uh, we have someone based in total weight loss, another based in BMI. So it's not, we really, we don't have a clear guideline to evaluate the result of our patients. But the most used classification is based in the proposal of Reynolds in 1982 with these uh, four levels of classification of the surgery, excellent, good, poor, and failure modified by Cristo in this uh, uh, slide that you have here. Again, when we look for that, they pick this number a little arbitrarily and the numbers take in account just weight loss. They are based in small group of patients. There is no scientific methodology validated for that and they don't consider quality of life, improvement of comorbidities, and attend the expectations of the patients. In terms of uh, analysis of reoperation, revision in bariatric surgery, maybe this is the best article we have in the literature. It is a systematic review for ASMBS, and we have some conclusions here, uh, and the five conclusions are based in that obesity is a chronic and lifetime disease with possibility of surgical revision. We should not accept policies that limit or prohibit revision of surgery. We should report more and we should look for a way in order to have a scientific criteria to really evaluate the result of our procedures. So when we look for some good studies that we have in the literature, you see that there is no homogeneity. They are too different in terms of analysis. They are comparing different procedures. They use the same uh, method to compare different procedures, and that's not fair. Uh, look, in, in this study, 61% uh, of the studies didn't define what, is, what, what could be considered failure of the procedure. For seven in 20 is less than 50% excess weight loss in 12 months. For six in 20, less than 25. So there is no homogeneity on that. The analysis of these results, there is no national standards to define uh, evaluation of results in bariatric metabolic surgery and the results can vary according the response of the patient and that's a good very good concept right now that we have different responses according the patient uh, for the same procedure will depend of the kind of the surgery so we can have variation based in the patient in the kind of the surgery in uh, uh, always regarding the team, the surgeon that has done a procedure, and how the patient was prepared, and how the patient was followed in the postoperative. 
So what is more important, the weight loss, the control of the comorbidities, the presence of complications as nutritional complications, anemia, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, what is more important in terms of evaluation? So the easy about using weight loss is, is just a number. It's, it's easy to, 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 to use a number. But when we have to combine these four aspects in order to evaluate, it's a bit more difficult because uh, we are not evaluating number. Anyway, that's a very important procedure. We have big numbers, so it's natural to have some patients that will not achieve really our expectations. There is no definable cause for obesity, and this uh, really it is complicated, and I think that we should look for any more scientific way to evaluate the results of the procedures. Thank you, Antonio. Okay, I think it's what we have until now. But I, I, I agree with you, they're not uh, good enough. Uh, absolutely, we have to, to, to improve our result. Let's uh, ask Professor Javier Salvador uh, to give us the endocrinological goals in obesity treatment. Uh, probably going to be some differences, some different approaches, and for sure uh, he will uh, give us some light on that. Javier, welcome again. You know, as I said, you know, Dr. Salvador is one of the leaders in Spain about uh, obesity and endocrinology, and he's the, the chairman of the Department of Technology at the University of Navarra in Madrid, in, sorry, Navarra in Spain, and more than welcome. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Antonio. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, thank the uh, organizing committee for inviting me to uh, speak uh, in this exciting session regarding uh, obesity uh, treatment goals. As a clinical endocrinologist, uh, my part will be dedicated to uh, uh, endocrine goals. Uh, so um, I have no uh, disclosures uh, related to this talk. And uh, in, in this slide, you can see a global perspective of different objectives for, uh, in obesity therapy. And you can see in the first part of the, uh, of the slide, uh, you can see the, uh, in, in red color the, uh, the aspects more related to endocrine control, endocrine uh, aspects of obesity. Uh, obviously, I have included body weight, body composition, uh, in the field of comorbidities, diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, uh, NFLD, uh, and of course also gonadal dysfunction and infertility as complicated of especially morbid obesity. And finally, just the two words about the prevention of metabolic complications and related to bone health. Uh, of course, there are another uh, object, different objectives, cardiovascular, all other uh, colleagues are going to speak about that. Uh, Right, uh, regarding body weight changes, Dr. Ramos has uh, commented on uh, mention of that. And in fact, there are, we have so uh, wide heterogeneity on uh, different criteria to uh, characterize weight loss success and weight regain. Uh, as you can see, there are different uh, criteria over the, the different publications and uh, related to just uh, the uh, goal of BMI, an absolute goal of BMI. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the most used uh, criteria relates to percent excess body, uh, weight loss, especially more than 50% uh, as a criteria of weight loss success. Uh, the same, similar to BMI, changes in BMI, but perhaps more recently, uh, the uh, authors are moving to the absolute uh, changes in body weight uh, using the total weight loss, percentage, percentage of total weight loss, especially 25%, or uh, altered weight loss, uh, I have, um, uh, more than 35% as recently uh, proposed by the Dutch group. Uh, regarding weight regain, I mean, weight regain is very important because uh, we know that obesity is a, is a chronic, progressive, relapsing disease, and therefore weight gain is initially expected uh, in all uh, therapeutic approaches. And uh, here, again, different criteria, and perhaps I would like uh, just to uh, uh, underline the increase in five points BMI over Nadir, uh, perhaps that is initially uh, less dependent of BMI than excess weight loss uh, or excess, uh, excess BMI loss. 
So uh, I think it's important, it's interesting. I'm not going to, to, uh, to solve the, uh, this, this problem here, but uh, in fact, what I will ask to all uh, people publishing on this topic is just to, uh, to uh, indicate clearly which are the criteria they are using. In fact, we need a, a consensus to use a uh, unified uh, criteria just to characterize both aspects of success and weight regain. Uh, well, the, my second goal uh, relates to body composition. You know that obesity is defined as body fat excess. So body fat excess not always has a co uh, correlation with BMI or with body weight excess. And that's the, uh, the point. So uh, we, I think we need body composition measurements to, uh, to characterize the, the evolution of obesity following bariatric surgery. And in fact, there are some uh, easy parameters such as weight circumference and neck circumference that in fact are reduced in a significant way following surgery. But I think it's interesting to quantify body fat mass. Here we have some data for our group uh, using the bat pod air displacement plethysmography and in fact, we, what we see following gastric bypass, you can see here, following 18 months and following three years after the operation, and you can see that the results assessed by BMI are a little bit different from those uh, observed when you are based in body composition. And in general, the, uh, the percentage of people with remaining obesity following, following surgery is much higher following, uh, when you use... Uh, body composition measurements to assess the, the outcomes. Uh, well, one of the most important points is diabetes remission. In fact, the uh, ABA proposed criteria uh, published by, by John Buse uh, about the, the, for the, the points you need to, uh, to comply to, uh, to establish diabetes remission are, you, you can see here, the complete remission, A1C less than 6%, Plasma uh, fasting pl uh, blood glucose less than 100 mill uh, milligrams per deciliter for at least one year in absence of anti diabetic medications. This is complete remission. Uh, par there are partial remission, there is partial remission criteria too. There are criteria for an improvement, and, if, and in fact, there are also criteria for prolonged remission when the uh, complete remission uh, lasts for more than five years. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Lots of predictive factors have been developed just to uh, predict remission. There are different scores. Uh, I think that we, we, we have some uh, conflicts there, but I would like to underline the, uh, one, of, one of the scores called IM, uh, IMS, uh, published by Aminian, and they were, the Dr. Bidal has collaborated too in order to validate those data, including the sever severity of diabetes, because with that index, they propose a, uh, suggestions to use a sleeve gastrectomy or gastric bypass to, to treat that patient depending on the severity of diabetes. In fact, the uniformity of criteria are very, is, is a very important uh, point, a very important aspect, because as you can see here, depending on the definition you use, the prevalence of remission is really dif very, very different. There are other markers of carbohydrate metabolism, in fact, uh, to assess uh, insulin resistance by a simple uh, blood sample with, uh, of glucose and insulin, fasting glucose and insulin, you can calculate the HOMA-R index, it's an index of insulin resistance, or the QUICI index is, a, is an index of insulin sensitivity, and that, I think that's important because these are parameters that are going to improve following bariatric surgery. Again, beta cell function is a key point because uh, there are many uh, uh, information indicating that bariatric surgery and weight loss improves beta, beta cell function in, in a, a very important per percentage of patients. So uh, I think uh, I would recommend to measure fasting C-peptide levels. And in fact, uh, from uh, the group of uh, Dr. Rubio from Madrid, from the Hospital Clinic of Madrid, and Antonio Torres published I, uh, the, the potential value or as of assessing glucose variability in order to predict uh, um, uh, diabetes remission, as you can see in this paper published in 2017. The other point is relates to diabetic complications. I mean, we, we need to treat diabetes. We need to, uh, to get a remission of type 2 diabetes in order to prevent the development of diabetes complications. And in fact, there are no many important papers uh, with uh, enough duration, but uh, I, I, I brought this one published in 2017 uh, that uh, demonstrates a 79% uh, reduction in micro 
uh, 48% of relation of macrovascular complications. I think there are many aspects uh, from a methodological point of view that can be improved in this paper, but uh, in fact, the, all, all data suggests that bariatric surgery and metabolic surgery is able to, to block or to attenuate the, the, development, the development of uh, diabetes complications. Regarding this lipidemia, it's another uh, in, important comorbidity. We know the classic remission criteria for a normal lipid profile in presence of no lipid or lowering medication. Uh, I think this is very important. And in fact, both gastric bypass and sleeve gastrectomy gets, uh, are able to, to induce a significant proportion of remission of that uh, aspect. Uh, well, uh, liver fat disease is a really epidemic, epidemia in, uh, among people with uh, severe obesity, and in fact, NFLD uh, accounts for 90%, up to 90% or perhaps more patients with that condition, and uh, steatohepatitis is, uh, is a worse condition and with lower uh, prevalence, and in fact, the, the most uh, problematic situation is fibrosis, and uh, therefore, fibrosis can progress and F4 state, some, um, and many times, is not reversible. So uh, that's very important to be diagnosed and to be followed with following surgery. There are different uh, uh, algorithms to uh, manage uh, according by using elastography and uh, NFS or C4, which are um, non-invasive index uh, extracted from uh, transaminase, uh, transaminase measurement, platelets, and uh, BMI, H uh, H1C, et cetera. And according to these, uh, to these uh, scores, we can guide, we can, we can predict, that, uh, we can uh, diagnose uh, the, uh, the uh, situation according to the more or less fibrosis, which is very important. In fact, we have data that uh, indicates that bariatric surgery, in this case gastric bypass, is uh, uh, accompanied by a resolution of steatosis, inflammation, ballooning, and fibrosis in a significant percentage of patients. So, uh, however, there is a 12% in this meta-analysis, 12% of patients uh, uh, experience a worsening of that condition. So there is a lot uh, still, I think uh, we, we got lots of uh, things to learn in that field. Uh, and uh, to, uh, to end with this uh, aspect, uh, the weight regain higher than 20% is associated with an impairment of the NAS NAS score for fibrosis three years after gastric bypass. However, weight regain less than 20%, there were no uh, significant differences according to that uh, index. So I think this is important because the, these results could help us to establish which kind or which magnitude of weight regain is really significant in terms of biology importance. So uh, I'm finishing uh, in, 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 regarding nutritional status, vitamins and bone health. Uh, this is really important. I'm not going to go in deep on that topic because we, we are out of time. And the, uh, there are another potential endocrine metabolic markers such as uh, assessment of leptin, ghrelin, and adiponectin, but I think we need more data before incorporating those measurements to clinical practice. In my uh, last slide, in re uh, regards to gonadal dysfunction, uh, obesity, uh, severe obesity is associated with a high percentage of uh, ovary, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome and a significant percentage of secondary hypogonadism, uh, hypogonadism in males. Well, we got data, very important data, indicating that bariatric surgery is associated with high taxes of resolution, both of, py of uh, polycystic ovary syndrome is it is a menstrual pattern, and of course, male hypogonadism, 87%. So, my conclusions, important progress, uh, we have done important progress in identification of goals. We need to achieve a consensus to unify criteria and compare results. Long-term results are needed. Additional treatment should be established when goals are not achieved. And in fact, I think there is a need for integrated criteria based in multiple goals to establish, in fact, if a patient who has been operated of bariatric surgery, uh, the result has been successful or not. Thanks very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Javier. You know, uh, you guy, uh, you know, you, we have so many goals to, to achieve. You know, I don't know if you are able to, to do that, to get that. Anyway, we can discuss after what we have a, after a final, uh, after finishing all the panelists, uh, we will discuss with our discussion, Dr. Son Gregor Bal and, and Carlos Casalnuevo. But anyway, uh, now next uh, speaker, uh, as I mentioned before, is going to be uh, uh, Dr. Leopoldo Perez de Isla. He's a, a very huge, a very high expert cardiologist. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, he's uh, working in, uh, as I mentioned before, Hospital Clinic San Carlos, a Complutense University in Madrid, and he's uh, performing and his uh, group uh, a, a huge uh, uh, work and investigation in terms of improving the comorbidities, uh, especially in the, in the youngest population. That's right, uh, Leopoldo. So uh, it's your turn. Thank you for coming here again, and uh, the podium is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank to the organization and especially Dr. Torres for inviting me to this meeting and thank you very much for you for being here. Okay, I'm, I'm not a surgeon, I'm not a, an endocrinologist, I'm just a poor cardiologist and I have only 10 minutes to convince you that the heart is very important in your obese patient. Okay, why the heart is important? Because this is the reason, this is in Spain, but it is, I think, that almost very similar in all your countries because we die of cardiovascular diseases. So this is the importance of the cardiovascular disease and we also know that the obesity is very related with the cardiovascular disease and that if we decrease the obesity, if we reduce the obesity, we can reduce the cardiovascular disease burden. So this is very important, but how to evaluate it from a cardiovascular point of view, for sure. Okay, this is a very easy way to do it. If we obtain a weight reduction, we can measure from the cardiovascular point of view this benefit in terms of reduction of cardiovascular mortality. Okay? This is the main end point. This is our main goal, but it is very difficult. And above all, it is sometimes not affordable. Okay? We can establish another end point, not such a hard as this one, but hard is the combined endpoint of cardiovascular mortality and cardiovascular or cardiovascular events. Okay, it's a hard endpoint. Okay, but let me show you three subrogate, three interim endpoints that sometimes could be very useful from the cardiovascular point of view. And these three points are based on atherosclerosis, based on heart failure, and based on arrhythmia. Okay, let me show you some tools that we can use to evaluate these three intermediate or subrogate, as how you can call it, endpoints. Okay, why they are important? Because they are less time consuming and they are cheaper. So we can use less money, we can, we can avoid wasting money, and we can evaluate these endpoints instead of the hardest endpoints from the cardiovascular point of view. So, three points, atherosclerosis, heart failure, and arrhythmia. Starting with atherosclerosis, we know that obesity is associated to a lot of different issues, and all of these issues, such as diabetes, such as hypercholesterolemia, such as uh, metabolic fat, they are related to atherosclerosis. So, how can we evaluate atherosclerosis? From several points of view, but I think that the human's preferred point of view is just to see them, okay? Just using our eyes. And we know that we can evaluate atherosclerosis, for instance, in the coronary arteries, for instance, using, looking at the calcification in the coronary arteries, just, you can see this paper was published in 1959, a lot of years ago. So we know how to evaluate atherosclerosis in the coronary tree. Evaluating the coronary calcium score, the CCS, is useful to diagnose and to establish the prognosis of our patients, okay? If the coronary calcium increases, the risk increases, the cardiovascular risk increases. If it decreases, you can reduce the cardiovascular risk. So this is a very important endpoint. So, from the point of view of the diagnosis, we can diagnose the presence and the extension of atherosclerosis, okay? And this is, there is a green arrow, okay? But 
CCS is not very good to detect coronary artery stenosis. This is the reason why the red arrow is over there. Okay, so we can establish the presence, we can establish the burden, the extension of the atherosclerosis, but not the presence of stenosis. For instance, this is not a paper about obese people. This is a paper about normal people from 45 to 65 years old working asymptomatic from the cardiovascular point of view. Summarizing this slide, we can say that here, more than 50, more than a half of people that are here now in this room have a coronary or at least an arterial atherosclerotic plaque, uh, although we are asymptomatic. So this is the importance. And regarding the prognosis, the CCS is completely related, it's a very well related to the cardiovascular risk. So, the real relationship is not between the CCS and the cardiovascular risk. The CCS, the calcium, is only one of the components of the coronary plaque, or the atherosclerotic plaque, okay? The real relationship is that CCS is a part, is just a portion of the plaque volume, and this plaque volume is the real thing related to the cardiovascular prognosis. The problem is that to evaluate the complete plaque volume, the whole plaque volume is very difficult sometimes, okay? So, when I mean, when I would say beyond CCS, I mean that there are other components in the atherosclerotic plaque. Fat, fibrous tissue, necrotic tissue, and these are very, very important. Okay, nowadays we have the possibility, we have the capability to evaluate all these components. Okay, can you see this coronary angiogram? Can you see the coronary artery? The answer is no. When we perform a coronary, an angiogra a coronary angi angiography, we are evaluating the lumen, and the artery is not the lumen, the artery is the wall. So, if we want to evaluate what is happening at the level of the coronary wall or the artery wall, we need to see the wall, not the lumen, okay? And we can see the, the, the wall. We can see the wall, for instance, using the IVAS, intravascular ultrasound, okay? Although it is an expensive and invasive technique. Okay, but nowadays, we can evaluate it with new techniques. Adopting some techniques from the, cardio, from the cardiovascular imaging technology, we can evaluate from a normal scan, from a normal coronary CT, we can evaluate the wall of the arteries from a non-invasive invasive point of view. We can extract the coronary tree, we can evaluate the wall, we can evaluate what is happening within the wall. For instance, this yellow line is uh, limiting the lumen and this orange line is limiting the external wall of the artery between the yellow line and the orange line, there is plaque. And we can quantify the plaque and we can even perform a virtual histology analysis of the plaque. So we can evaluate it. This is a very accurate and reproducible method. We are using it every day. And with these kind of methods that we evaluate the wall of the artery, we have demonstrated that several drugs are able to decrease the black burden. So, we are avoiding the impairment of the wall artery using drugs. Can we demonstrate the same using reducing the body weight? This is an, an answer, a question to, to be answered. So, we are decreasing the atherosclerosis, and this is our question. Black burden, a good surrogate point to weight loss? I think yes, but we had to demonstrate it. A second point, heart failure. We know that there is a parallel increase in the epidemics of heart failure and obesity, and we know that people with obesity are people that are prone to suffer from heart failure. Okay. So, we usually use normal conventional tools to evaluate the heart failure by means of cardiovascular imaging, but nowadays we can evaluate the deformation. Technically, we talk about it, about strain, myocardial strain, 
Okay? A strain means deformation. We can evaluate the deformation. And to give you an example, we are using it because we can establish an early, and very early, diagnosis of myocardial damage, for instance, in patients with uh, treatment with cardiotoxic drugs or in patients with asymptomatic severe valvular heart disease. Why not using it in people with obesity? In this paper that we published several years ago, we demonstrate in a cohort of uh, obese teenagers, we demonstrated that there is a problem in the deformation in the heart of this, in the myocardium of these obese patients when, go, when we compare them with non-obese teenagers, okay? So, the, in obese teenagers, the heart is larger, okay? The function is normal? No, because the changes in the deformation in these patients are similar to the changes that we can find in a healthy elderly man or elderly woman, okay? So, this is, there is a problem, an intrinsic problem in the myocardium of these patients. So, this is the second question. Myocardial deformation analysis is a good surrogate endpoint for weight loss? Okay. We have to demonstrate it, but I think that the answer could be yes. And arrhythmia. We know that there is a very important relationship between obesity and atrial fibrillation and another kind of arrhythmias. But it is very surprisingly that in the scores that we use to evaluate the risk in patients with atrial fibrillation, obesity is not included. We usually use the CHATS and the CHATS basque and you cannot find obesity as an item in these scores. So there is a problem. We have to modify them, probably. The normal EKG is a useful but not accurate method and sometimes we have to use prolonged uh, long-term devices to analyze, for instance, these intelligent t-shirts to analyze what is happening with the rhythm in our patients. So, the third question, atrial fibrillation burden is a good surrogate endpoint for weight loss. We have to demonstrate it, but we think from the cardiovascular point of view that it could be very, very useful. So, to conclude, I think that between weight reduction and cardiovascular mortality, we have a lot of different subrogate endpoints that could be very, very important to evaluate in a short-term and cheaper analysis and cheaper trials and cheaper studies what is happening at the level of the cardiovascular system in our obese patients that are waiting loss, uh, losing weight. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 Leopoldo, you know, I think you, you, a lot of challenges, you know, the cardiologists, you know, we put three, three very important topics, you know, I'd like at, at, the, at the end, I think the discussion uh, can ask you probably what are the most uh, easier, more accessible uh, of these three, the plague, the myocardium failure and the arrhythmia, you know, it's going to be very interesting, you know, very nice, congratulations, a very nice talk. Uh, Next speaker will be our uh, uh, next chairman of our integrated health uh, uh, company. It's going to be uh, uh, Mario Kane. He, I'm sorry, Marco. I did I miss you. I'm sorry. Oh my goodness. No, I'm sorry for 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 that because I didn't see you uh, anyway. Uh, welcome, Marco. So. Our next speaker will be Dr. Marco Butter from Switzerland. Uh, you know, he's going to be uh, talk about, I think, one of the most important topics, which I miss you, you know, talking about the quality of life. Because sometimes uh, surgeons, endocrinologists, cardiologists, endocrinologists, and all other specialists are thinking, in what, is the, what I consider is the best for you. But the patients are saying, I don't want your best. I want my best. So, uh, Dr. Ruther, uh, he's going to talk to us about quality of life, obesity, and weight loss. Marco, uh, congratulations. Welcome to, to Madrid, and thank you for supporting this session. Very important session. Go ahead. The podium is yours. Well, Antonio, thank you very much for that uh, unique introduction. <laughs> um, and thanks for having me and giving me the opportunity to share some of our views on quality of life, obesity, and weight loss. Well, talking about quality of life, what, what, what do we mean by quality of life? There are some definitions out there. It's certainly an individual's own assessment, an own assessment of 
general well-being, physical and mental health status, social relationships, and also env environmental and economic factors. And on the right, you see a diagram summarizing lots, um, certainly not all, but a lot of these factors that need to be taken in uh, into account. What's important is measurement or quality of life in itself is a multi-dimensional concept and the measurement is very subjective. So it's not surprising that there are many instruments to measure and to evaluate um, quality of life, especially in the context of bariatric surgery. I uh, share a table from a recent published uh, review from Mesa summarizing what uh, we have at hand and there are, um, the, these instruments can be um, separated into three groups. There's the generic instruments, they measure in quality of life independent of the underlying disease. They are the disease specific instruments. Um, they focus on the quality of life related to a specific disease such as obesity and they are the outcome specific measurements that only focus on one special aspect of a given disease, for example, the back depression in, uh, inventory. The most frequently used among those are the uh, SF36, um, which you may know, and the impact of weight on quality of life light uh, questionnaire. However, overall, there is little to no consensus regarding the definition of quality of life after bariatric surgery or the ideal survey to measure it. And in fact, if you go through the literature, you can find one systematic review trying to analyze patient report and outcomes in bariatric surgery. And this study evaluated 86 studies. And in this 86 studies, 68 different validated measurements or instruments were used to report quality of life. So comparability is rather limited. And in fact, the majority of literature that you can find reports on quality of life usually as a secondary measure, secondary outcome in studies, primarily designed to look at different outcomes, primary outcome in the most cases being weight loss or resolution of comorbidities such as type 2 diabetes. But it's like, mostly it's like people design a study and they're interested in weight loss and then, okay, what can we do for secondary outcomes? Uh, I think we have to do quality of life. So that's also important. There is really, uh, there are not many studies out there that use quality of life as primary outcome. So what do we have? I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of you know the BAROS system, the Bariatric Analysis and Reporting Outcome System that was introduced in the late 90s and 97, and that uh, takes into account three main areas to define success after bariatric surgery, which would be weight loss, changes in medical conditions, and quality of life, and good improvement would be considered a uh, increase in 108%, and excellent improvement in quality of life of 166%. However, if you look at it and keep into account my usual scientific interest, which would be changes in eating behavior after surgery, these questions are rarely addressed in these questionnaires. When I talk to my patients, they report to have reduced hunger, increased satiety, some of them even change their food preferences, and they have developed aversions for certain type of foods, and we don't even know whether patients like that consider that as a benefit or actually would consider that as a negative aspect of the surgery. So if you ask yourself what drives quality of life satisfaction after bariatric surgery, it's certainly body mass index. As indicated here, there's a univariate and multivariable analysis for overall treatment satisfaction in 261 patients five years after the surgery, and it's pretty clear that in the univariate and multivariate model, body mass index is one of the strong predictors of better quality of life after the surgery. Another aspect that needs to be taken into account has been shown by this study by Kolotkin et al, who were able to demonstrate that women experience the effect of body weight more and different than men. And keep in mind that more than 80% usually of the patient population that we operate are actually female. So female think different about weight and they feel different about weight and how it affects quality of life as shown in this study. One thing you need to keep in mind when analyzing and looking at all these validated questionnaires and instruments, they are biased in a certain way because they only, the patients are only able to answer the questions that we as a professional group think that might matter for them. Um, so they can only answer to those questions. And, and we don't know whether there's something else that they actually would like to report, but it's not covered by the questionnaire. One way to address that, and that was done in my study group uh, back in Zurich, 
and uh, by my student Daniel Gero, who's shown on the upper right left, and who will present that data later on in the room Berlin at 2.30. So if some of you guys want to know more details about it. So what we did is we used our Facebook community, it's called Adipositas Zürich, and asked our followers um, to write down five words which first come to their mind when they hear the term weight loss. And these five terms, they were able to link them to different emotions, a list of emotions uh, from 20 emotions they could, could select from, and also to uh, scare the body image dissatisfaction based on that Stunkard scale. So basically, they have to pick one of these figures down there, how they view themselves. Um, and this is what you get. So actually, in fact, it took us three weeks to collect the data, just to show you how powerful social media can be in a scientific environment and scientific setting. And we were able to re uh, retrieve the respondents of nearly 1,500 people. So it's, you know, pretty representative. And you get two different populations. And I'm not going into detail, but if you look at the words that are in these two clouds, and consider that the bigger one word is written, the more frequently it has been named by the patients. You will find some words and terms that you never find in these validated questionnaires. One of the most important points for our patients is to be able to go clothes shopping again. Easier clothes shopping was one of the most frequently mentioned aspects of our patients if it comes to quality of life. So keep in mind that the instruments we use may not detect aspects in daily life that are relevant for our patients. Um, and this method is called free word association and I think it was going to be the future because it, it represents the patients and not so much the investigator's perspective of quality of life. And in fact, as mentioned before, body image dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction correlated significantly with the BMI. Patients with a higher BMI after the surgery having a higher level of dissatisfaction. There, especially some, or there, it's, it's important to mention that there are specific threats to quality of life after bariatric surgery. Some of them are listed here. Uh, of course, surgical complications, social stigmas against bariatric surgery, excessive skin, depression and anxiety, and an alcohol use disorder. I won't go into detail for all of these aspects, but I want to highlight one, which is excess skin. I would like to share the data from one recent review published by one of my former colleagues from Imperial College, Shutan Ashrafian, who was able to show that most studies together show that physical functioning and weight loss increases after body contouring surgery. So when you and I and we do our gastric bypasses and sleeves and all these funky procedures there and we make people lose weight, we only do half of the way to improve quality of life. We have to do the last step too, which addresses this cosmetic question, which is very important for many patients as well. So in summary, obesity has a definite impact on quality of life. I think that's unquestionable, even without other comorbidities. Bariatric surgery results in significant and lasting improvements in patient reported quality of life, but the variety of instruments limits the ability to compare outcomes across studies. And there are threats to quality of life after bariatric surgery, so, so, such as uh, weight regain, social stigma, or excess skin. And all of these occur usually longer time after surgery and way beyond usually quality of life is measured. So we need longer follow-up studies as well. Needless to say that I would like to thank my entire study group. So I'm not having only the best, but also the most happiest uh, <laughs> study group, obviously. Um, I don't know what this is. Um, whatever. Thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. <clears throat> Thank you, Marco. The nice uh, approach to the quality of life, you know, standards. And it's one of the, in my opinion, one of the next goal we have to get uh, for this uh, patient uh, submitted to bariatric or other, uh, you know, therapeutic approach to obesity. Please have your seat. Uh, and, and then let's move on because I will say we will discuss all at the end of the, of the session. Uh, let's ask, you know, uh, Mario Ken, uh, as I said, you know, he's a present uh, chairman, uh, chairwoman in this case, chair uh, the, of the International Health Committee. Uh, uh, she's going to deal with the subject of multidisciplinary support role in improving outcomes. This is so important it is, you know, uh, probably I'm very sure she's going to convince us about that. Take care. 
Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, nice to follow the quality of life talk as well. So talking about multidisciplinary support and the team is very large, it does include the surgeon but as we're talking more about the support roles, looking at all the different disciplines, um, not possible to cover everybody but I'm trying, going to go and try and make a good attempt to look at the different professions that are involved in the support role. And I want to just mention the Bariac project, and this is a byproduct of the Biban sleeve trial, which has taken part in the UK. And what they did was ask patients and healthcare professionals to say what the core outcomes should be, and then they actually rated those. And for both the patients and the healthcare professionals, weight was one of the most important outcomes. And though we talk about weight, it's not just about the weight that people achieve, it's about the maintenance and the avoidance of weight regain, which is obviously really important. Quality of life has already been covered, and for the healthcare professionals, that tended to be lumped together. But for the patients, they were interested in mobility, ability to go back to work, um, about feeling in control, self-esteem, uh, confidence. And then we've got the technical complications, which is obviously more the surgical side, but healthcare professionals have a key role in identifying those issues. And then at the bottom of the scale uh, for core outcomes was dysphagia and regurgitation, and the very bottom was micronutrients. So in terms of core outcomes, weight was seen as the most important, and micronutrients as the least important. And for me as a dietitian, I do have a bit of an issue with that. But what I can see from here is that all of us have a role to play supporting the patient to achieve those outcomes. So um, you'll all be familiar with Stephanie Sogg's paper about the psychological preparation for surgery. And this is maybe identifying those issues where patients may need more support before going for foot surgery. It's not to say they can't have surgery, but it might be identifying about them having more support and actually having, making sure that the time is right for them for surgery. Um, but also looking at people's ability to plan and to, go, to make goals, about the psychosocial history, and we've all got a role to play in that, um, and about the healthcare-related um, behaviours such as substance abuse, about the importance of physical activity, and then, although we talk about psychological preparation for surgery, the behavioural monitoring after surgery is really key. And certainly in our integrated health sessions, David Sawyer has made a really good case about the need for ongoing psychological support post-surgery. One of the issues that's really important to patients is about weight regain. And what we know from some of the studies is what people are doing at six months is predictive of their outcomes at 10 years. So making sure we've got those good engagements, making sure we've got that very good follow-up with the nurse, with the dietitian, the psychologist, and promoting those behavior changes, and actually looking at the quality of the diet. Also, the psychological uh, issues such as food urges, decreased well-being, anxiety, depression, addictive behaviors, um, they're all predictors of weight regain. So it really does emphasize the need for ongoing psychological support from all healthcare professionals and actually access to specialists when they're needed. And I think sadly, um, there are many uh, teams that don't have access to good psychological support from the healthcare professional that is the best to provide that. And certainly in our integrative health session this morning, we've heard a lot about the importance of follow-up but also making sure that we're actually giving it towards the patient, making sure that they do attend and engage with us. And we don't always get that right. Um, as a dietitian, the maladaptive eating is really important. And there can be many causes, so there can be technical issues, such as an overtight band, an asthmatic stricture. But also we have people who are delighted at losing weight, and they're so afraid of weight regain, they may have food phobias, food avoidance. Um, also, in addition, because we've got patients who might experience regurgitation, they might eat too fast, they might end up 
uh, relying on this wider type foods, which then leads to poor nutritional intake, uh, maladaptive eating, and of course, in longer term, that's weight regain. And again, I think the follow-up of the dietitian and the nurse is absolutely really key. In many uh, centres, the nurse is able to go ahead and actually organise those investigations. And then obviously the dietitian can do a nutritional assessment, deals with the nutritional values. And I think all of us uh, rely on sometimes that gut feeling when we're talking to the patient and things are not going quite as planned and being able to refer back early to the surgeon. Um, in Leeds, we do have to make use of our clinical nutrition team and they might be in the periphery, but certainly in Leeds, uh, with some of our population, helping us to deal with some of the long-term nutritional issues and the malabsorptive procedures. <coughs> Dale Bond, who is also present in our integrative health sessions, has been making a real case for the importance of physical activity. And other people will say that they become more active after surgery. In reality, that doesn't, uh, isn't really seen in practice. And what Dale was making the point was actually about engaging with patients pre-surgery, improving their quality of life, improving their self-confidence and their self-esteem, so we can help support patients after surgery in being more active. And we do know that being more active actually helps with weight maintenance and avoidance of weight regain. And then obviously we've got the nutritional side of it. And as a dietitian, very concerned about the more malabsorptive procedures. We know pretty much what we're going to get with the sleeve gastrectomy and the gastric bypass. But the Judon switch, it's been around for years and we're still seeing the nutritional complications. And now we've got the one anastomosis and the SADIS, which also may contribute to nutritional complications too. So what I'd ask is really when we're talking to patients, we've got to remember that their goal and the healthcare professional goal is weight. The nutritional problems are very low down on their list. And as a dietitian, they might be assessing somebody's uh, culture, their usual diet, their ability to uh, buy high protein foods. But when they meet the surgeon and they talk about an operation that gives them a greater weight loss, it's very hard to dissuade a patient to go against the surgeon's view. But as a dietitian, I might be more concerned about the long term consequences of nutritional deficiencies. So we've got to work together as a team. And I'd make a plea for anyone doing any new surgical techniques, is actually involve the whole team. Make sure the whole team has got the training. Make sure you know what nutritional supplements you're going to be able to prescribe from the patient. Make sure they can get them, but also to make sure they can actually afford them as well. And we all know our adherence to any medication is poor, and it's the same after some of the malabsorptive procedures. And if you're doing a malabsorptive procedure, it's the responsibility to actually report. Even if the consequences are not good, we need to know more about the long-term nutritional problems that patients will experience. So that's my bias. Um, and then obviously, touching on the role of the pharmacist, and again, this is a very neglected area. And uh, certainly we've had some very good pharmacists who've contacted me about my patients to say they know the patient hasn't been coming to get their repeat prescriptions, they've made appointments to see them, and they've been able to talk to them on an individual level about how uh, better to um, get better adherence. And Ike Graham, who's a member of the Integrated Health Committee, she did a local project with her pharmacist looking at the role of the pharmacist pre-surgery, and it was really valued by patients. And then obviously, uh, going to do further work about the role of pharmacy after surgery and the patient's able to meet with the pharmacist and actually talk about their issues, about drug interactions. Um, some drugs are going to uh, create some further weight regain and be able to talk to the patient about how they actually manage those issues. And also about the importance of long-term care. And in the UK, we did come up with a standard of saying that all patients need annual review lifelong annual review. Sadly, it's a recommendation, it's a guideline, but we're not able to implement it. But I was very interested by a paper by Homan um, and colleagues who looked at the treatment of uh, vitamin and mineral deficiencies after the duodenal switch. And what they were doing was initially monitoring in the Barrett Surgery Centre and then passing long-term care onto their uh, physicians. 
And I think this may be a long way forward because if not, we're going to isolate ourselves from uh, clinicians who maybe think that bariatric surgery just ends up in long-term problems when we know most patients are okay, but we need to have better ways of actually managing those long-term conditions and access to annual follow-up. So, from my view, ensure that all members of the team are actually involved in local, the local teams and in discussions, the national committees, making sure that if so, chapters have their integrated health committees, seats on the executive board like we have, and also just working with the integrated health committee, how can we help you to better facilitate this? And how can we be more involved in some of the position statements uh, that um, need not just a surgical view, but more the integrated health view. And then just remembering all our patients are different, different cultures, different parts of the world. We have different issues, but we need to work better together, uh, locally, nationally, and internationally, to actually improve outcomes for our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. I think you have enough time afterwards to, to discuss your point of view. You're going to be very attractive. And now, uh, let me ask, you know, my good friend, Nahum Begel Blake, coming from Israel, uh, like a magic wand, you know, to answer a, a very important question. Uh, responders and no responders. <laughs> Is there a, a way to predict the outcome of the patient in bariatric metabolic surgery? Nahum, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming. And it's your turn. Uh, buenos tardes eh, todos y muchas gracias Antonio por la oportunidad. Uh, yesterday I did something I never done before after having a nice jar of uh, uh, a good sangria I sat down and I wrote a narration for my uh, talk which usually I don't and I have it here and all, all this was done uh, in purpose of staying in time within time frame of my 10 minutes. Uh, but this morning I saw the time frame here is a little bit more flexible. But I hope that uh, with your permission, sticking to my papers, I'll uh, stay in time. And uh, actually, Antonio gave uh, the previous talks the privilege to talk about success. Success in cardiology, success in, endocrinolo in, in endocrinology, and I'm going to, take, going to speak about failures. So everyone in this audience is, uh, has that sad experience of meeting with a patient who failed or who regained. And then we ask ourselves, uh, was it possible to, to foresee that event? Could we take any measures to, to prevent it? Can we predict? No, we cannot predict. Of course, if you do the wrong procedure to the wrong patient, like if you, if you operate on a full-blown psychiatric, psychiatric patient, or you do a sleeve or a bypass for a super obesity, you and your patients are going to fail. Now, um, Researchers with a less uh, nihilistic attitude than mine try to define uh, the predictors and uh, the most frequent ones you can see it here in front of you, uh, starting with BMI, age, male gender, lack of pre-op uh, pre psychobehavioral preparation, and so. Take, for instance, the, that study by the Kotam tribe in which they show that patient weight loss can be accurately predicted, accurately predicted by simple preoperative factors. They did it on sleeve, and Al Hayat and colleagues uh, showed the same, uh, the same uh, conclusion on gastric bypass that uh, if you take into account higher initial BMI, older age, presence of uh, diabetes, and preoperative weight gain, <coughs> you, you, you're bound to fail. On the other hand, and you take this uh, paper by uh, Anita Karkulas from the 
LABS consortium. It is uh, about more than uh, 1,500 patients, followed up for three years at least, and you can see that uh, their conclusion is those simple baseline variables uh, have limited predictive value uh, for an individual, opposed to what we saw previously. Now, preoperative uh, uh, weight gain. We talked about it as a predictor for failure. The group of Di Maria showed that there is no difference in weight loss or resolution of comorbidities, whether they, you lose five kilos or you gain five kilos preoperatively. Now, what about uh, our psychological uh, status? We all tend to say that uh, we must prepare our patient or we must select out our patients according to, to some, uh, some scores or some psychosocial uh, evaluation preoperatively. Now, David Ashton reviewed the, the literature about it a couple of years ago, and he states that a significant major, minority will fail bariatric surgery, a significant minority will exhibit preoperative abnormal psychological profiles, that those two groups uh, overlap to a great extent, and therefore abnormal, abnormal psych profiles identified preoperatively predict less favorable weight loss outcomes postoperatively. So in his review, the first statement is true, second statement is true, third is highly questionable, and uh, the fourth is simple false. And uh, his, conclusions, his conclusions are very bold and straightforward, and you can see them by yourself. So data is conflicting. I can bring you another hundred of papers for this side or for the other side. Why is it so? Why can't we draw a, a conclusion from the literature? Well, in my opinion, two reasons. The first one is that if obesity is a multifactorial disease, postoperative weight regain is a super multifactorial phenomenon. And if we try by, uh, by simplistic ways of, uh, uh, of uh, linear uh, logistics or, or so to, to find out whether we can predict or not according to very few simple factors, uh, in my opinion, it's a naivety. And uh, the second reason is a methodological one. I'll let you a few seconds to read what uh, the great Amos Tversky had to say about the subtle but the very important difference between prediction versus postdiction and most what we are doing is post-diction, and that mistaking post-diction as prediction underestimates our, the, the uncertainty of our world. This paper is unique. This paper is by the group of uh, Michel Souter, and it is unique because it takes into account the difference between prediction and post-diction, and uh, what they did on a Swiss cohort, post-diction, they try to identify uh, what brings to failure, and then, as a prediction, they took their model and applied it on two French cohorts. You can see th those are those, the, their predictors, and they found a very good correlation between prediction and real-life outcomes, saying we are not postdicting, we are predicting. Just take in mind uh, something that they have the higher BMI as a predictor for a good outcome. Quite unique. Now, I can't, <coughs> I can't leave you like this and say, well, there's no solution. There is a solution, and the solution will come, in my opinion, from big data. You can see here all the, the sources in which we can gather data on our patients. Those on, with, with the uh, green circles are, are, <coughs> are, are uh, 
projects that we are involved in in, in, my, uh, in my department. And after gathering zillions of tons of data, the point is how to process them. We all know how to, to use an uh, SPSS uh, package and to do linear uh, regression, but this is not enough. This is not enough. The techniques are totally different, and all of them are new for us, and they, they use math modeling, algorithms, machine learning, and artificial neural networks to bring us to the way of, of concluding meaningful, meaningful uh, conclusions. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the best introductions to, to the use of big data in surgery can be found in uh, Cirugia Española, which I'm sure uh, Antonio reads on a daily basis. I just found it. Uh, it's, not, it's not very popular in Israel, but it's a brilliant, brilliant introduction to big data and uh, surgery. Now, we talked about age, BMI, gender, blah, 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 hypertension, all those very, very common predictors researchers used. And they, they didn't deliver the good, as I showed you. But what about taking the, in, into account the, the preoperative hemoglobin, the preoperative lipid profile, the socioeconomical status, the, <coughs> the liver function test, whether you're married or divorced or not? What about taking into account anxiety and family history and employment, whether it is a conversion or not? Our gene profile, our preoperative metabolic rate, our microbiome, all of those factors theoretically can influence the outcome. And we must take them into account. And if you take, let's say for um, 5,000 uh, patients, and each patient had a preoperative, a one year and two year set of data. And all those data, they come up to millions of millions of bytes of information which cannot be processed in the way we usually process uh, data until now. But there are beginnings, and nice beginnings, like this one, showing the, uh, that artificial neural networks can predict, look at the second one, at the, at the second line, can really predict what's going on in real life. Now, machine learning reached now a level of, of clinical significance and clinical use in other parts of, uh, of medicine and surgery, like in uh, oncological surgery. This is a model of predicting uh, what, will be, uh, what will be the real nature of, uh, of a cystic lesion in, in the pancreas according to, you can see, a lot, a lot of, of information gathered on each patient. And it is working, and this is now one of the most important tools in, uh, in pancreatic surgery. You cannot, you cannot draw any conclusions for, from this state of data without machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. Now, Dor Dicker, uh, a colleague from, from Israel used the database of the biggest healthcare provider in Israel, the H biggest HMO, on more than uh, 1,300 uh, bariatric patients in order to see whether the, dia the, whether the diagram or the advanced diagram uh, model can be a tool to predict preoperatively what will be the, your results if you are a, a, a diabetic and it used machine learning and it used machine learning because look at all those factors which came into account in the original uh, diagram in, uh, which appeared in Diabetologia 2017. They had good results and the diagram uh, it can be downloaded from the web. Danny Bensvi, a PhD in our institute, 
is using the Israeli National Obesity Surgery uh, Registry in order to generate heat maps, like this, which you see with all those kind of, of, of greens, in order to, to predict traje trajectories, not only in, uh, uh, in, uh, in BMI, but in liver function test, and, and you can, uh, it is unpublished data, you can hear him tomorrow morning, for four o'clock or so uh, in the afternoon, I recommend it. Now, just a couple of days before, before, I, before I, I traveled to Madrid, you see it's in the, the end of August, my, my, texture, my, my lecture was, <coughs> was completed. There was a press release by the American College of Surgeons, 77, 5,000 operations during five, five years. They had a model based on big data analysis and they say, okay, we have a calculator, we can calculate your risk to, to do so or to do that. I'm still waiting. It's not in the, on the market or not in the literature yet. This was the, just a press release, but this is a big, big step towards the future of implementing big data into uh, surgery. And to sum up everything, I would say that literature is conflicting. You cannot draw uh, conclusions. No simple predictors can be identified. We cannot go and deny an operation for someone just because he has a higher BMI or so and so and so. Big data analysis may bring uh, a change. I don't have the data yet, but this is my feeling. And uh, we surgeons, we must embark on that ship of big data immediately. We have to learn and to cooperate with statisticians and with bioinformatic engineers. This is a totally new era for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I hope take your seat. You know, let me now introduce the two discussions. They are going to to uh, to take uh, you know to take the, the you know the, the work the, the the duty of discussing with all of you guys. Let me introduce here on my left is Carlos Casalnuevo, is professor of surgery in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and there is uh, Dr. Shanghai Agraval from UK. Please, guys, it's up to you. Uh, a squeeze. Uh, these guys, you know, in terms of getting some goals in determining how all of the items they mentioned can be useful in a short time, and for sure, what of the different items can be used in the medium t uh, term. So it's up to you guys. Thank you. Well, uh, congratulations to all the speakers, and uh, when uh, we listened uh, all these uh, lectures. We, we found that uh, we have a lack of uniform uh, definitions. And uh, if you uh, uh, look... ¿Puede incrementar el volumen de este micrófono, de los micrófonos portátiles, por favor? Sí, go ahead. Hola. Yes, we can find... Uh, 23 different definition, definition of uh, uh, weight failure. We have uh, 21 different definition of uh, weight regain. And uh, I think it's uh, better to talk the same language for get a better result and compare all the, the, the literature. Uh, we need to, to know the definition of outcome. Uh, we are going to use the weight loss. We are going to add the quality of life. Uh, we need to, what happened with the morbidity. Um, I think was the, in the beginning, well, more than 20 years ago, uh, Horacio Oria and Melody Murhead, uh, they describe the, the barrows, and uh, for more than 20 years there was a combination, not only the weight loss, if not take importance the uh, comorbidity and important the quality of life. Of course, uh, now it is necessary to add it many things as perception of the patients, the 
uh, habit uh, of eat, eating habits, etc. Um, we need, uh, after the definition of that, how to measure, how to measure the, the outcome. We need to use what? Percent of excess weight loss, percent, percent of uh, total weight loss, the BMI loss. Uh, you can read uh, in the literature and we can find different things. And after that, one important thing is the follow-up. The follow-up, it is necessary to maybe more, well, the ASBS say 75% and minimum five years. And uh, sometimes I listen one lecture and, say, and yes, ask to, to the lecture, say, uh, how many percent you have the follow-up? 23%. And for 23%, you can take any conclusion. And uh, this is the third thing I think is important. Uh, totally agree with the uh, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary team. I don't know if it is better to call interdisciplinary team, because the interdisciplinary, they are in interaction between them. Uh, I don't know why they continue using the, the name multidisciplinary team. And after that, uh, uh, it's very difficult to find the uh, uh, predicted factors. Uh, in, we, we intend uh, some years ago and about uh, 300 patients and uh, only with one technique in and found only the sex was different in the uh, excess weight loss. But uh, as you say, that is very difficult. It's multi, super multi uh, complex to, to, to found the, the factor, uh, predictive factor. Well, uh, again, congratulations to all the lectures. Uh, I would like to congratulate everybody who is here and contributed in the lectures today. And I definitely, I think I benefited the most hearing different uh, specialities. And, and I would like to thank all the audience who is still, still there with us uh, in spite of the lunch time. And we are all hungry. I think we should conclude the session now and, and, and we should go for the lunch. Is that, are you happy with that? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for all, all of you attending us.